welcome to sections 4.12 and 4.13. So what we're going to discuss in these sections is really just a lot of terminology that we need for the 4.14 and 4.15 sections, as well as we need to talk about what Mendel did after his first set of experiments called the monohybrid cross, where he crossed the purebred, tall, short for instance, got all tall, then crossed those two hybrids, or heterozygotes as we know now, uh, mixed individuals, to get that three to one ratio, three talls, one short in the F2s. So the terminology that we use to describe these organisms is gonna be come down, coming down to this idea of heterozygous and homozygous. Hetero means different, so any organism is a heterozygote for a particular trait if it has one of each of the alleles, one of each of the possibilities. So if I cross a plant that always gives a tall allele or factor, and I cross that with one that always gives a short, you're going to end up with an individual with one tall and one short. Heterozygote, they're different. With a homozygote, you have two ways of getting this. You can have a homozygote that has two uppercase, two dominant alleles, or you can have a homozygote that has two lowercase. So when we talk about homozygotes, you have to make sure that you're clear about is it homozygous dominant or is it homozygous recessive? Because just by saying homozygote, I don't know which way it is. And so you'll see me a lot of times write HD for homozygous dominant, HET for heterozygote, and then HR for homozygous recessive. That'll be my shorthand that you guys can feel free to use. Uh, and we'll, you'll see that a lot when we do like ratios. Like this will be the common genotypic ratio. Number of homozygous dominants, number of heterozygotes, number of homozygous recessives. Now dominant recessive we pretty much brought up. So the dominant is the one that will show up in any heterozygote. So it's pretty easy to figure out which trait is dominant. You just take a pure breeding dominant with a pure breeding recessive, and the F1 generation should be 100% the dominant. And so that's the key here is that F1 generation, who won in that head-to-head -head battle, if you will, to see what happens. This is kind of cool because the recessive then is the only one that has the ability to hide. So this can be important evolutionarily where you can carry a recessive allele but I wouldn't know if you're a heterozygote. As long as you have a single dominant allele, it will mask or cover that recessive allele so the recessive allele can show up later, like in the F2s or F3s, so further on down the line, but it doesn't have to show up every generation. Then genotype is gonna be the description we use to describe your alleles. So this one will typically be letters. So it'll be big P, big P, or big R, big R will be homozygous dominant. Heterozygote's gonna be, once again, typically gonna be like, you know, big A, little A, big T, little T, big P, little P. It's always gonna be the two different guys. And then homozygous recessive will be the last type of genotype that you typically get, and that'll just be two lowercase, two of the recessive alleles. Now, phenotype, and this is what Mendel was looking at, is different. Phenotype is physically what you, you're able to see, physically what we're after. So when we're talking about something that's phenotypic, it's going to be like tall or short or purple flowers or white flowers. And so this is not the exact same as genotype because when you think about a dominant situation, the tall individual, which is his dominant, could have either homozygous dominant or it could have a heterozygous genotype. Whereas short is the one that's actually kind of unique. To be short, you got to have all shorts. Because if you had any tall alleles which are dominant, you'd be tall. So the only way to have it is to not have any of the dominant alleles. So the short phenotype, the recessive phenotype, will typically only have one possible genotype, homozygous recessive, but the dominant will have two, and this does make it tricky. Where if I look at someone phenotypically and see you're tall, I don't know for sure which of these situations that we're dealing with. I don't know if you are ultimately homozygous dominant, or how does I go? And that can be important sometimes if you're trying to specifically pass on one trait. If you're a heterozygote, it's only a 50-50 chance you pass on the dominant trait that we're after. If you're homozygous dominant, it's 100%. And so if you're trying to breed something like livestock, this can be a big deal trying to make sure you figure that out. Now, before we wrap it up, let's go through and discuss exactly what Mendel did with his last set of experiments. The first thing he did was the monohybrid crosses, all right? So he ultimately got two individuals that were like, you know, big R and big R. These were the F1 individuals. And he crossed them, and he got an F2 ratio of three dominants to one recessive every time. 
So three tall, one short. Three purple flower, one white flower. Three yellow peas, one green pea, etc., etc., etc. Now, he then said, all right, let me look at two traits at the same time and see what happens. So he calls this a dihybrid cross because he still did the same thing where he started out and had two guys that were homozygous dominant for two traits and crossed him with a guy that's homozygous recessive for two traits. So he ended up getting an F1 generation that is going to be, and I'm trying to make sure I'm using the same ones here, that's going to be a heterozygote for both traits. So this is my F1 again. And then he crossed them, and his ratio in the F2 generation was 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. This was significant for him. It's what we call the law of independent assortment because he was able to figure out that it wasn't like, even though the parents had it this way, it wasn't like round and yellow were stuck together. It wasn't like wrinkled and green were stuck together. That's what the parents had. So you can kind of expect that maybe we just get a 3 to 1 ratio. Maybe three of them would have both dominant traits and one of them would have both recessives. So this was significant that he got this 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio because it shows that the dominants can mix with either or of the recessives. We're not tied to being both dominant or both recessive. We've got every possible combination. So 9 are dominant for both, 3 are dominant for one, recessive for the other, 3 of them are dominant for the other trait and recessive for the other trait, and then there's the one lonely sad little guy that's recessive for both. So his dihybrid cross was important to let us understand this idea of independent assortment, that what you get for the first trait doesn't affect what you get for the second. So essentially, I can be round and yellow, or I can be round and green. I can be wrinkled and yellow or wrinkled and green. All of those are possibilities. Now, because dominants are dominant, you know, they tend to show up more frequently, especially in a hybrid cross, you will see that nine of them are dominant for both, you know, and only one of them is recessive for both. So there still is definitely a distinct, you know, leaning towards being dominant, but there's not anything where you have to be dominant for both. So being tall in this little analogy here doesn't affect whether or not you're purple or white flowered. It would have no effect on it because they independently assort. And now as for why this happens, keep in mind that genes are located at specific places on a chromosome. So if you look at chromosome 6 in humans, and if you kind of blow up a tiny section of it, because it's a ton of DNA here, you'll see there are specific areas on this chromosome where specific genes are found. They'll always be at those specific areas. Now, they might have a different version of that gene, a different allele. So in other words, we might have a gene, and I'm not saying this is, but that we do have a gene, let's say, for height that's on chromosome 6 at this particular spot. What I'm saying is this allele, the specific sequence of DNA that's there, could say be tall or it could say be short. But it will be there and it will say something. And so we call that location a locus. Or in some cases you'll see it called a loci if you're referring to it in plural. So just to understand, genes have specific locations on specific chromosomes at specific parts of that chromosome where they'll always be at. So if you see me mention locus or something like that, I'm just referring to that specific region. Now that's important because if you then follow the chromosomes through meiosis, because we just said the genes are on the chromosomes, you can figure out Mendel's laws. Mendel's law of segregation says that we go from two copies of everything, right, big T, little t, we'll say, to one, where the gametes, what you actually pass on to your offspring, will be big T or little t, not both, one. That's ultimately shown by meiosis, where in meiosis we half the amount of genetic material, we have half the number of chromosomes, and so what you're doing here is getting only one of the two. Two sets to one. Law of segregation. Split. Now the law of independent assortment is explained by independent assortment of the chromosomes. We talked about in meiosis how you have where for chromosome one in humans, you can grab moms or dads. For chromosome two, I can grab moms or dads. Doesn't matter what I did for chromosome one, every different chromosome for all 23 sets, I ultimately can pick moms or dads. And it doesn't matter what I did for the others. And so genes that are on separate chromosomes, and that's key here, they have to be on separate chromosomes, independently assort them. It doesn't matter which I grab tall or short, because on a separate chromosome, I've got round or wrinkled. And so I can grab whichever one I want. It doesn't matter, it doesn't affect it. 
Now you will notice that this sometimes will not be true. A lot of independent assortment only works if they're on separate chromosomes. So we'll talk about later genes that are on the same chromosome because they won't independently assort. But for right now, we're kind of ignoring that and assuming that all genes are on separate chromosomes, so all of them will independently assort when independent assortment happens in meiosis. So this is just kind of the explanation of why all these things happen. Mendel didn't really know about meiosis. He basically discovered what was happening in it before we had an understanding of what meiosis even was, which, as I said, makes him kind of cool.